Good evening. Welcome to the Unity Discussion here at the Renaissance Center of Fried Hardeman University in Dixon. Here at this location, we're only in our fifth academic year, our fourth academic year, our fifth academic year, and uh, our home campus in Henderson, Tennessee, we're celebrating our 150th uh, anniversary this year. I know many in this audience would have uh, some type of association with Fried Hardeman, but also several in this audience would have association with Florida College. And I appreciate the leadership of uh, the president there, Buddy Payne, and uh, we're thankful to have both of those colleges uh, and universities represented in the rotunda, as well as also the magazine's Truth Magazine and Gospel Advocate. Uh, tonight is a good night. It's a night in the pursuit of unity. Uh, I know that all of us know that across the Brotherhood, there are continual discussions that take place uh, among individuals that are seeking uh, to find a place of unity in the matters that will be discussed tonight. I can't help but think of Paul's long sentence at the beginning of Ephesians, the fourth chapter, where he ends that sentence by urging us to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit and there's a difference in the spirit of unity and the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. And um, he begins that sentence by urging us to walk worthy of the calling. And so that's part of the walk of the calling. And then in the middle of the walk of the calling and, and the urging for unity, uh, he, he places in there four characteristics. And he says that we should be humble and lowly and all long suffering and forbearing with one another. I'm thankful for these two gentlemen and what we have already seen in their writings. Uh, we are well aware of the fact uh, that they are sincere. We're aware of the fact that they have put much time and effort in this. In this. And we're aware of the fact that um, their pursuit is to speak truth in love. We're thankful for the magazines that have published uh, this discussion so far, of course, in writing. And then tonight, for all of us to enjoy and be a part uh, of a live discussion that will continue on this plea for unity. Uh, Kyle Pope is an evangelist in Oak, Oak Church of Christ in Amarillo, Texas. We're glad you're here, Kyle. Doug Burleson is associate professor at Fried Hardeman as well as a minister at the Estes Church of Christ in Henderson. But when I look across the audience, I'm also reminded uh, that there are others here. That is that there are many here, many here, if, not here if not all, individuals that have come to the gracious Father through the blood of Jesus Christ by obeying the truth that's been written, inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's only by God's great love and His rich mercy and His saving grace that we've received not only this gift of salvation, but that we have received adoption into His family. Uh, we are His children. He sees us as brothers and sisters. And between the washing of feet and the cross, Jesus pauses between that act of service and sacrifice and... He raises the bar on love as He said, I'll give you a new commandment that you love one another as I've loved you. But then in the very next verse in 35 of John 13, He gives a mark of identification. He says by this, may all men know that you are my disciples. And so our, our hope and our prayer and our expectation that tonight in the things that are said, but also in the things that we hear and the way we respond and react to them, that truly we would leave here and all people would know that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. Tonight we're thankful to have the editors of both magazines with us tonight. I'm thankful that Brother Mark Mayberry is with us in just a moment. Uh, he will say a few introductory remarks and, and lead us in prayer. And then also our Brother Greg Tidwell of the Gospel Advocate uh, will also have some introductory remarks. We can't come to an occasion like this uh, without thinking about the words of our 
and our, our, of our God and Holy Scripture in Psalm 133 and verse 1. And surely the moments like tonight make God smile when He says how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Brother Mayberry. I wanted to take just a moment <clears throat> to express my appreciation uh, to Randy Duke and to Greg Tidwell for, first of all, beginning this discussion and dialogue several years ago when we were invited, several of brethren with whom I have fellowship and association, to come to the offices of the Gospel Advocate and sit down and talk. And that led to a follow-up event occurring about a year later uh, in Coleman, Alabama, where Brother Jim Deason hosted a gathering where about 25 men from each side of this division uh, had gathered in uh, study and in prayerful consideration of what the Scripture says on the issues that divide us or that separate us. It was a profitable discussion. It was one that was heartfelt. It was one where people spoke very passionately but from conviction. And that was where I first met Brother Doug Burleson. And that was followed up a year later by a subsequent meeting. And as a, as a way of continuing the dialogue, I approached uh, Greg, or I approached uh, Doug and Kyle and asked, would they both be willing to carry this discussion forward uh, in a written form and then later talk to uh, Randy and Greg? And they volunteered and immediately embraced the idea of, yes, let's publish it in both journals. And so for a, a fellowship that has been uh, at times uh, it's in a state of alienation and in a state in which a lack of communication has occurred for a number of years, at least on any consistent basis, this has been profitable and beneficial to open the Scriptures and see what saith the Lord, what saith the Scriptures. And, and that's our goal is to seek to pattern our lives according to the biblical standard and conform ourselves to that. And the spirit that these two men demonstrated in our meeting in Coleman uh, so impressed me that I thought they would be perfect candidates to engage in a, uh, a brotherly and uh, cordial written discussion, and they've certainly done that. And then the uh, Freed Hardeman uh, people uh, vo even offered the opportunity of providing this discussion, which is even icing on the cake. So we appreciate that, and uh, that is certainly conducive for good when we open our Bibles and study together and seek a common understanding of truth. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your word and your revelation and the fact that you have promised that as we seek to understand the inspired apostolic writings that we can have the understanding that Paul possessed and know Jesus promised to us, ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And we're thankful for the sacrifice that that truth involves, the death of your son, the delivery of the inspired message that becomes our pattern. And so help us as we study tonight to be brotherly, to speak the truth in love, and to seek common understanding and a fellowship based on obedience to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I would like to echo the sentiments that have already been expressed and my appreciation for the men that you are going to hear tonight. They are both scholars, but more importantly, they are men of deep faith. And as you listen to them, while we certainly are very candid about differences that exist in our understanding and our applications, I want you to note that that which unites us, our confidence in Scripture, our love of Jesus Christ, and our commitment to the Lord's Church, what unites us is much greater than those issues that divide us. The Gospel Advocate Company is very privileged to be part of this, and we want to be supportive of unity in truth. Without anything else, Kyle, I'll turn it over to you. My name is Kyle Pope, and I thank all of you for being here tonight. I appreciate the fact that some of you have come from some distance, and Greg and I, Doug and I are both honored that you are here for this. I preach at the Olson Park Church of Christ in Amarillo, Texas. Uh, I want to thank Brother Shannon for uh, 
uh, opening this facility to allow us to be here. I want to thank Mark Mayberry for first asking us to be a part of this discussion and Greg for agreeing to publish it at the same time. Uh, mention was made of Jim Deason. Jim wasn't able to be here tonight, but I want to express my gratitude to him. You know, we wouldn't have met each other. We right. wouldn't have had this opportunity had it not been for the efforts that Jim made, and I'll comment on that a little bit more a little bit later. Uh, when Doug first talked to the administration at Freed Hardeman, shortly afterwards, you talked to me about the fact that it might be referred to as a unity discussion, and you were concerned that you didn't want me to take exception to that, and I appreciated that. I, I have to say that while I cannot have, and I don't advocate, a unity and diversity attitude, I don't think that it can be that we can simply say, you do it your way, I'll do it mine, but we consider ourselves one. At the same time, if we believe in the Bible, and it is our goal to follow those patterns, the goal of all of us should be to be united in the same mind and in the same judgment as the Apostle Paul advocates in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. And it is in that spirit that uh, I am here tonight, and I appreciate so much the opportunity. You know, we can't come to understand one another if we don't talk to each other. And so I, I'm honored to be a part of this. Those of you who are here tonight, there may be some things you hear for the very first time. Or it may be that you hear some things that you have thought in the past and made you angry. But I hope that as we look together at what the Word of God says, uh, we'll simply objectively try to see what our God wants us to do. And that's our goal and that's our objective. Um, a couple of comments that I wanted to make just uh, about it's kind of the background. If you were not able to read the articles yet, I think uh, there are copies of those that you can get in the foyer and you can read those. But if you haven't done so, uh, I wanted to give a little bit of my background in terms of my involvement with that. Uh, these first came from some studies that we were a part of, and I think they were very productive studies. Uh, on our side of the aisle, so to speak, some of the brethren at those felt like a little bit of a lingering question was the issue of expediency. And why I say that is that some of us felt as if, I think some kind of on your side felt as if, well, you do it your way, we can do it our way, uh, why can't we be united in this? And to many of us, we felt as if, wait, these are additions, these are not expedients. And so it seemed like kind of a natural thing to follow up those discussions with this written exchange. And so I'm, I'm excited about the fact that we can, uh, we can do that. I want to communicate to you all, if you were not aware, that when Mark first asked us to do that, uh, Doug and I began working together uh, with one another about how we could do that in a way that would be respectful to each other, in a way that would be uh, effective. Uh, throughout the whole process, we talked with one another about the issues that we wanted to deal with, and all throughout the process, if there was some wording Either of us wanted to change, we were willing to do that. So uh, when it came to the final product, it was our words. And I appreciate Mark and Greg that they, they didn't seek to change that. Uh, they were very accommodating uh, to us in, in that, and I appreciate that uh, so much. Um, as we think about that, you know, the, the fact that we were able to do that, I think, uh, is important. Because as I said, we need to talk with one another if we're going to understand each other. And I, I appreciate that I think throughout this whole exchange, we, we argued our case, but I think we were gentlemen to one another, and I think we were brothers to one another. And that's my intention this evening as yeah. well. And I, I certainly hope and believe that we can, we can do that. Um, I want to make it clear, though we're going to disagree about some things, uh, I don't approach this with any sense of animosity. Uh, you know, the Apostle Paul, you know, over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 15, even in that situation where there he's describing those uh, who have walked disorderly that must be withdrawn from, the wording there is powerful because he says, don't uh, count them as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. And while from my perspective... I have to say in love that I understand these issues to be disorderly behavior. Uh, 
I want to try to persuade you tonight. And I want to do so not as your enemy. Or if you're here and you hold those views, I don't want to speak to you as enemies. But as brethren, I want to challenge us each to look to the Word of God. And my prayer this evening is that uh, God will bless this effort and that ultimately God will be glorified by the things we do. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks to you for being here. I know we have a lot of people watching online. It's been wonderful <clears throat> to see the way that people have responded to this. I'm looking forward to seeing what the follow-up to this might be. appreciate so much Mark and Greg having the courage to publish uh, material in each of the respective journals that some readers might not have appreciated. Uh, and also appreciate the fact, and want to apologize in advance for those of you who might be bothered by the glare from Kyle and I tonight yeah. under this bright light. Uh, also, I'm thankful for the CEI bookstore. I know that with the passing of Miss Tammy, it's been a very difficult uh, year, but the way you all have treated me uh, has been tremendously compassionate and kind. And uh, Greg Tidwell has been su such a friend to me. Were it not for him and Mark and Jim Deason and you, Kyle, I would not have been a part of this conversation, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, we need to talk about some history. And it's true that we're divided. Um, God adds us to the body. But in some ways, we continue to live in parallel universes. Uh, this has divided our families, our communities, even on the mission field. Uh, there's a messy history here. And I want my children, all four of whom are in attendance tonight, and maybe some others to have a better understanding of that context. I'm going to keep it brief because I want us to get to the questions. I'm thankful that in this discussion, Kyle's never called me a liberal, and I've never called him an anti. We've been respectful of one another. That's going to continue tonight. I'm not naive enough to think that tonight's going to make our differences go away, but if at the end of this evening we're able to still have a conversation and love and study the Scriptures together, then tonight's been a success. A success. I want to talk for just a minute about Kyle. Uh, he's my brother. Uh, he's a good man. Kids, this is Brother Kyle that we've been talking about and praying for. I hope to spend eternity in heaven with Kyle. I believe he loves the Lord, his family. I believe he loves the church. He spends a lot of time studying the Word, proclaiming it, traveling the country, preaching it. We do a lot of the same kind of work in parallel universes. Uh, because about 30 years before I was born, there was a division. And these days, most folks don't know anything about the Herald of Truth. They couldn't pick Roy Cogdell, Foy Wallace, or G.C. Brewer out of a lineup. They couldn't tell you the difference between Florida College or Freed Hardeman, Gospel Advocate or Truth. And if we really asked them to talk about why we're separate, they could talk about that for about 10 minutes. And that's probably about all there would be unless this has been something that's near and dear to their heart. And there's a reason our communities are divided. Two congregations in a town that don't cooperate with one another, don't speak with each other. Two mission congregations in a large city on the other side of the world that won't cooperate. Members of the same family here in a few weeks that are going to have awkward interactions. I know we've talked about this in our own families. We can't ignore that history. And one older brother emailed me angry about the fact we were having this discussion. And he said, uh, don't ignore the fences that we built. Don't tear down fences that you don't understand why they were put there. And while I appreciate what he was saying, the question is, are the things that we're talking about tonight worth the division that has come to fruition? Are those fences God-honoring, or are they wrong? And if they're wrong, let's do everything we can to approach the truth in love and be united as brethren. I think several of us are tired of the slippery slope of liberalism. We're tired of a disregard for Scripture. We're tired of a disregard for what it is that our God has commanded. And I'm in that discussion with you. I'm in the discussion with students that I have who have worked through this and, and are still working through this, perhaps some who are online tonight. I'm not suggesting that we're going to necessarily change one another's minds, but maybe there are some people who are watching and participating in this who are on the fence. And you've heard institutionalists like myself, which I hate that label. I want to be a Christian. 
You've heard us described as people who have total disregard for the authority of Scripture and have total disregard for a hermeneutic that respects the authority of Scripture. Or you've heard people like my friend and brother Kyle described as those who don't care about orphans or who don't care about benevolence or who somehow are legalistic in their thinking. And I I think that part of what we can accomplish when we talk with one another is overcoming those presuppositions and those false assumptions about one another. I believe in commands, examples, and inferences, but I also believe in context. That's a large part of what I spent my time talking about in these articles. And I also believe that a big part of what we're dealing with is a 20th century American discussion about modernization, about the way our culture changed and how we responded to that. Perhaps we could go back in time and talk about a split over Sunday schools, people who felt that there wasn't authorization for Sunday schools in the early 20th century who now look at Kyle and I, and perhaps it was because of the institution or because they thought women shouldn't be leading those classes, and they look at us and say, you're both wrong. Or people in the early 20th century who thought that multiple cups or baptistries or perhaps paid preachers, that these kinds of things were without authority, and we've heard from some of those people. We've heard from people who've told us, I don't think you mind me sharing this, that we're both wrong and that we're the reason that there's so much trouble in the world. I don't believe that, but I do believe there's some things we need to talk about. I'm not looking over your shoulder wondering what you're spending out of your church budget. There's no real concern on my part whether you're sending a check to Herald of Truth or not, and that's somehow going to be a mark of your soundness. The problem for me comes when you begin to say that supporting that kind of work is without authority and that doing so will send me to hell. You've never said that. But like you, we've had those experiences and heard people who've been very cold and very judgmental in that regard. So I also want to open up the Scriptures tonight and search the Scriptures and better understand what God's will is for us. I benefited greatly from reading Hughes and Harold, reading West and Wolfgang, and thinking about the story and why it is we've divided along those lines. And I'm not saying it's all about modernization, but truth is, had God not blessed us with financial means and political freedom, this might not be the same discussion that it is tonight. When you look back through Christian history, there's not been a whole lot of discussion about what we're talking about tonight with regard to limited benevolence and perhaps institutions before the 20th century. Why is that? There's some things we can explore in our questions together tonight, and it might be that some primitive preachers will look at both of us and say, we're disappointed in you. You're not as non-institutional as you used to be. Or you're not as institutional as you used to be. What I'm concerned about is being a child of God, being a Christian who respects his inerrant word and who tries to interpret that in a way that is authorized. And that's what we're going to spend some time talking about tonight. And so we've got some questions we're going to ask one another in love. And it might be that we follow up on these some, but Kyle's allowed me to ask the first question. And I want to get into that now and not take any more of my, of our time as we talk about this. But In your first article in Gospel Advocate and Truth, you talked about benevolence, and I think it's been a bit unfair to assume that non-institutional congregations are somehow not involved in benevolent work. And in that article you said, in most cases, we help individually. I wondered if you could expound on that process a bit more, discuss examples of benevolent work that you're involved with. Maybe we could compare some stories and some methodologies there. I think it's a great idea. I do think that part of the misunderstanding may be that when folks speak of limited benevolence, they imagine that that ignores needs, and that's not what happens in situations like this. Um, when we're talking about various issues, like you had, you had asked in the, the question that you sent to me, some things about uh, preaching and that kind of thing. If you're talking about preaching of the gospel, I think there's scriptural authority for that to happen following the pattern of church to preacher directly. Where I preach at Olson Park, we support six men, uh, one that's in Alaska, one that is in South Africa and works in Botswana and Zimbabwe, and we send money to him directly, not through uh, an organization, not through another church, directly to him. Um, He, the man in South Africa, actually has helped to plant some churches in Botswana and Zimbabwe, and they're subsistence farmers there. And due to drought conditions, some over the last few years, Olson Park has uh, sent aid to help them, uh, to help the saints there uh, in their time of need. Now, when it comes to the perhaps more difficult question, and that is, 
non-Christians. That's one of the things that we addressed in the articles and we'll talk about a good deal tonight. While we don't see that there is authority from the collection for the saints to offer benevolence to non-Christians, that does not mean that situations are ignored. Uh, we'll have people that will come to the building, either during times of services or, you know, if I'm at the building at the office, I may have people. And often what we will do is we've asked two of our men to visit with them and kind of find out some information and then report back to uh, any individuals that are interested in helping. Now, most often, we will help individually. Through those that kind of approach, we've bought groceries, we've helped with temporary housing, we've helped with repairs and travel expenses, but it's not something in which needs are ignored. Now, you also had asked me in your written questions about uh, orphans or children. Um, I know many Christians that have personally adopted. In fact, when I first moved to Olson Park, there were uh, families or extended families that have been involved in 10 adoptions. And there's an organization that non-institutional brethren are involved with known as Sacred Selections that, have, that personally helps place uh, children and get them uh, in, in homes. And uh, it's, it's not supported by any church. It is something that's individually funded. Uh, but I think all of those things address those particular needs. Uh, it's not that things are ignored. Appreciate that. <clears throat> I think we're going to get into this more as we go. I don't want to follow up and take time away from questions you might ask me, but sure. I'd like to follow up on some of that later. You bet. Um, in my last article, uh, I demonstrated what I believe are different patterns seen in Scripture uh, for cooperative, uh, collective benevolence and evangelism. And what I see from Acts chapter 11, verses 28 through 30 in the matter of benevolence is church to church in the matter of evangelism as demonstrated in Philippians 4, 15 through 18, uh, church directly to preacher. Do you agree that those are binding patterns? If not, why not? And if so, don't those violate sponsoring church arrangements? Well, I appreciate that, Kyle. <clears throat> I think uh, I would describe what you did there as describing some situations in Acts and Philippians that have a context. I want to talk about a methodology that I'm concerned about with regard to biblical interpretation. Because I think we're looking at more than commands, examples, inferences here. I'm reminded of Roy Cogdell's work. Now I think in its 13th edition, uh, Walking by Faith, a Study of Institutionalism, where Brother Cogdell walked through six rules of biblical interpretation, starting with the rule of uniformity. He talks about harmony and unity talks about universal application, limited application, materiality, which is the idea that we've got to be able to replicate that in our world, and then really personal conviction as a part of that as well. And in that first example, talking about the rule of uniformity, Brother Cogdell says that if something happens in Scripture, and it's the only way that you see that happening, that's a binding pattern. And so if you see, even though it's a miraculous situation where Agabus anticipates a famine, uh, we know that the Christians are supported in that. We can talk about households and who all that might involve later on. But because that was the practice in Acts 11, 27 through 30, or because over when Paul's saying thank you at the end of the letter to the Philippians, as a result of <clears throat> Epaphroditus being sent over and showing gratitude for the great relationship he's had with the church in Philippi since Acts chapter 16, that that's a binding pattern. I would suggest that there are principles in there that will help us to understand what voluntary benevolence looks like. No one's compelled to give. That's a part of the way that we cooperate with one another. But what concerns me is if we use that same methodology elsewhere in Acts, we might find some other patterns that are distressing because neither one of, the, neither one of us are enforcing those. We might insist, for example, that when a congregation wants to send out a preacher, according to Acts 13, verse 3, that they fast and pray. That when they appoint elders in Acts 14, verse 23, that they fast and pray and lay their hands on them. Or we might insist that when someone takes a confession, it has to be in the water, based on Acts 8, 35 through 39. Or we might also insist that when we take the Lord's Supper, it has to be in the evening, based on Matthew 26 or Acts 27 through 12. So my concern is making those examples prescriptive. I think that's the key question here. When you have, and we'll talk about what authorizes later on, <clears throat> 
statements that are either demonstrative, imperative, interrogative, when you have examples and you consider how those then mesh with statements like we'll talk about in Galatians 6.10 or James 1.27. So I think what troubles me is the way that Cogdell's methodology, and I'm not saying that's your book, although you wrote the questions on that book, and those were good questions. I wrote some questions too in reading that, and that's what I'm getting into now. But uh, And the thing is context. It's not about counting words, as you know, but one of the things that distressed me as I read that book very carefully is, for example, authority. That word's used 215 times. When you look for the word Christ, 74 times. Conscience, 15 times. When you look for the word context, the word's never used. And I know that it's not a book about biblical interpretation, but there are several chapters that are about binding examples, binding principles, what authorizes. And when we talk about what authorizes, I'm not going to use context as a scapegoat to avoid what's clearly stated in Scripture. But I think it's important to look at, and we could study Acts 11 or Philippians 4 in greater detail tonight if you would like to, but I don't see those either one of those as a binding example. And I've got questions about both of those we can get into more. Now let me follow up with another question here. Um, in my last article... Let me make sure I'm getting the right question. Yeah, in my last article, I mentioned congregations. No, 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 I'm sorry. What are the specific New Testament passages that you would suggest govern the formation and usage of the church treasury? Uh, when does money go from belonging to individuals to being considered a part of the church treasury? For example, is it when money is given, when it's counted, when it's deposited, etc.? Let me say as a little bit of a follow-up to your earlier statement <clears throat> or to your uh, answer there that I think part of the difficulty with the methodology that you're describing is it becomes very subjective in terms of defining what are you going to follow and what are you not going to follow. You know, when I see a pattern and we talk to the religious world to say, let's do it like they did and we can be one, um, if I do what they did, then I can see that. The, what you're suggesting seems very subjective. Now, well, let me, let's talk more about that. Well, what about the four patterns that I've suggested that are just like the Acts 11 or Philippians 4 pattern, where yeah. there's singularity, but it's the only time we really see disaster relief, by the way, is apparently the reason for the collection, yeah. 1 Corinthians 16. So, well, let me get to, to yeah, that in, subjectivity. In this answer. Um, yeah. on, on that question of the other examples, I think some of it, now I appreciate Brother Cogdell's work. I, it, you know, he, he would explain things different than I would explain things. However, I, I just kind of simplify it in terms of can I see it? If I see it and I do it, then we're, we can say that we are acting upon Scripture. Now, to answer your question yeah. about the treasury, um, I would look to 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2. Uh, it, in many ways, just like Acts 20, verse 7, shows an example of an act of worship that's done on the first day of the week, uh, the Lord's Day. And while it's specifically mentioned as for the need in Jerusalem, I think it sets a precedent for how do you get money? Uh, scripture talks about a lot of circumstances under which the church will be utilizing funds. For example, you'll see supportive preaching, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 14, Philippians 4, verses 15 and 18. You will see uh, support of elders that labor in the word, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, or uh, qualified widows in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 9 through 16. You'll see relief of needy saints, Acts chapter 11, verse 26 and 30. So, it's clear there are things the church is going to need funds for. What is the precedent for how you get that? I think it is the 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2 example. Now, to that I would add, and this will lead us into some of the things that we'll talk about, yeah. some of the descriptions of the collection. And I, I mentioned these in the article, but 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4, it is described as the fellowship of, uh, koinonia of the ministering to the saints. You'll see in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1, they are ministering to the saints. Romans 15, verse 26, the contribution, again, koinonia for the poor among the saints. So I, I think that not only describes what it's, uh, what it's about, but how it's used. I think that would be one of those elements as well. I would also add that I think there are times in which if you have a command that's given in Scripture, 
it necessarily infers that what's necessary to carry out that command is authorized. And I think assembling is an example of that. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Now, we don't have to have a building, but if that's what you need to have to be able to assemble, I think we can draw authority from that, the necessary inference involved in that, in that command. Now, you'd ask the question about when. And I would look to the example of Ananias and Sapphira because I think there what you see from Acts chapter 5 and verse 4 is it became, it, it no longer was theirs when it was given. Now, your question about deposited or that kind of thing, I can see circumstances perhaps in which, well, I put the wrong number on a check. Can I change it? You know, I don't think that changes the principle that when it is given as an act of worship to the Lord, it then becomes the, uh, scripturally authorized works of the church rather than what I do with my own money. Would you, would you uh, describe Ananias and Sapphira's gift as individual? When they, well, I, I think they gave it into the collection for the saints. It's not described that way, but that seems to right. be what is, what is happening there in Jerusalem. Yeah, because I think part of the challenge is with Hostafel language, Colossians 3, or Ephesians, also 1 Peter, maybe even Titus 2, you know, you, and I don't want to jump around too much in our questions, but you cite the example of the Good Samaritan as a single individual who's doing benevolent work. What about a family? What if the Good Samaritan's wife and children had been there? What if two or three Christians had been there? Is it the need to contribute individually to the one who's in need, or can they collectively? I just wonder... What was the word you used? Hostel? Yeah, household code. Uh, household hostafel. Oh, okay. I apologize. But okay. I, I just wonder collectively how many Christians can participate in that kind of benevolent work. So Before if Christy becomes, and I and our children yeah. purpose to give together, uh, can that then be used collectively to aid someone, including perhaps a child that's not yet reached the condition of accountability, which we'll get into later. But I mean, using Ananias and Sapphira as an example is ironic because obviously it's a negative example, but it's mm -hmm. also a family. Yeah. So anything that we're arguing is individual, I'm, I don't know how to work the family into that. I don't know how to work Jesus' statement about where two or three are gathered. I think that's part of where the confusion rests in my thinking on what you've Well, I, I would agree that I think that's where some of the confusion is. And I think when we get into these issues of when are we acting as a church, maybe that yeah. can address some of that. Yeah, very well. Thank, and I would agree, First Corinthians 16, one and two, my, my challenge there is if that's our uh, authorization for a worshipful act, uh, can that money then be used for things outside of benevolent work, uh, disaster relief, especially when we piece together 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, 1 Corinthians 16, Acts 11. I'm not saying they're all the same disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, also, the for the saints description, well, that's who the money is, is seemingly going to on the occasion of that particular disaster. So I, I, I want to follow up with that and, uh, and, and ask you, uh, actually, I think the next question is your question. I yes, apologize. Sir. Yeah, that's all right. In, in my last article, I mentioned congregations that I know that have established and uh, operate uh, nonprofit, distinct evangelistic organizations, not sponsoring churches, right. but their own organizations that are separate and they solicit contributions, and they will send out preachers. Do you consider that to be unscriptural? Uh, if not, how does that differ from the American uh, Missionary Society? Yeah, we talk a lot about missionary societies in our articles. I think when Campbell was elected president of the American Christian Missionary Society in 1843, that was a terrible day in the history of the American Restoration Movement. Very divisive. One of the things you replied in the articles with regard to that discussion was, is the only problem the fact that that became a bully pulpit for the North with James Garfield and all the things that occurred there. So I think it's a really important question. For me, the issue, and I'm a bit concerned, you haven't done this and I'm thankful, but in some conversations, it seems like the cry of missionary society is, is a straw man because for me, it's about autonomy. Has the congregation maintained autonomy? I'm not aware of any organization that someone might associate with the church. I'm trying to be careful with my language there, given the way you replied in the articles. Uh, I'm not aware of any local work that is being outsourced uh, 
where someone's saying, an eldership saying, hey, we don't know anything about this, you do the work. I think if we do that, that's clearly not the work of the church. The church is sufficient to do her work. Now, if there's an organization that Christians collectively contribute to, like Sacred Selections or 1213 Adoption uh, Agencies that are associated with non-institutional churches, or Florida College, Athens Bible School, great. But I do think trying to draw a hard line between the work that that organization is doing and work that Christians who collectively represent the church are doing is is sometimes very difficult to maintain. Well, this particular so could you give example, me an example. This particular example, the I think the congregation has started a separate organization that uh, you can go to their nonprofit website and it's considered separate and distinct. Although the congregation started it, um, they, I have a lot of problems with that. Are the elders able to interact with that? Are they able to oversee that? Well, I don't know all the details on that. I think it's a separate board that takes care of all of yeah. that. And, and to me, that just, you know, I'm not trying to throw up a straw man. To me, that seems like the very thing that uh, at the turn of the 20th century um, was involved in many of those uh, divisions. And, you know, the irony is that particular congregation began <laughs> at the time of those divisions at the beginning of the 20th century, and yet now they're doing what they opposed at the mm. beginning of the 20th century. I think if a congregation decides that the way they want to evangelize, the way they want to edify, the way they want to uh, do benevolent work is simply by writing a check, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, elders need to be autonomous with regard to overseeing that local congregation, Acts 2820, or Acts 2028. And I think that's part of what I'm asking for when I'm asking you, can you give me an example of when you think of a, a, a modern day missionary society, what would an example of that be? Right. That was your next question. Yes, that, um, I would simply define it as any organization, uh, whether it's organized by the congregation or completely separate from it, that solicits contributions from the congregation and then sends out preachers. Okay, so it's not about the autonomy of the congregation, it's about the money. Well, I think the issue becomes, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but is there ever authority in Scripture for a congregation to fulfill, you know, kind of like what you said, if it's just a matter of sending off a check, what they're doing is they are expecting another organization to carry out what they are doing. I, I don't see any authority for the church to ever do it through somebody else. And that's one of the things with the American Christian Missionary Society. It, my reply, I think, in the articles was, was the problem simply that they were trying to control the churches or was it the fact that it's not found in Scripture? And that's what I would, that's the problem I'd have. So if a local eldership says, uh, we really want our children to be well educated, we want them, and that, that's a work of the church, right? Education. I mean, we argue that 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, that a part of what we do is to make sure we train the in people scripture. who are in our country. Education is scripture. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. Uh, so if we want to do that by buying material from Gospel Advocate or Truth magazines, and bringing that in from the church budget to educate our children, we're not handing the responsibility to educate our children over to someone else. And I would suggest even when we send them to Freed Hardeman or Florida College, the elders of that congregation are sh still shepherding those young people. Mm -hmm. So part of my concern is when we say missionary society, it doesn't seem like we're really talking about the organization of that body as much as we are where does the money come from. Because if the elders can still oversee the flock and understand the material we're getting from Gospel Advocate or Truth we believe to be sound. The education these children are getting at Florida College or Freed Hardeman we believe to be sound depending on our perspectives here. Then how are we handing over the keys? Mm -hmm. Acknowledging the work of the church is sufficient but we're talking about Christians and that's a part of what we need to talk about. Can the church be the church outside of the assembly? Right. And we'll, we can right. save some of that. I'm sorry to go no, ahead no, of us. <clears throat> These issues in many ways um, only become divisive when elderships will impose upon congregations that which cannot be supported by the commands, examples, and inferences of Scripture. Uh, a similar thing is going on now in so-called progressive churches who will bring in mechanical instruments of music or who will put women in the pulpit. Um, if congregations would simply be content to do what we can find in Scripture, 
these divisions would disappear in my understanding, in my judgment. Amen. Um, with that said, I'm curious and I'm trying to understand how you see it different. Because if, if we just confined ourselves to what we can find in Scripture and we didn't try these innovations, there could still be many good works that could be accomplished without violating anyone's conscience and without dividing the Lord's church. What do you see that's different about our division and your opposition to the progressivism? Yeah, I think it's about what we find to be prescriptive. And we can come back to what authorizes. I think we need to talk a lot more about that. But, I mean, the truth is, part of the problem with progressivism is that we take truth and treat it like opinion. But it's also dangerous to take opinion and treat it as gospel truth. And I think that's part of the problem here, saying that an eldership imposes, that's, that's pretty strong language, because we might be actually imposing a pattern that we've found that's actually descriptive rather than prescriptive. I think there's some ways contextually, historical, literary, theological context, we'll get into that more, that we can find, okay, this is something that's either commanded, it's exemplified, it's something we necessarily infer, but it's constant and true throughout Scripture. And that's what I would say about benevolence uh, when we get there in a little while, is that's something that's actually not only expressly stated, it's tied to the character of God, it's tied to the ministry of Christ. It's very much a part of what it means to love our neighbor. And so, uh, look, again, I don't want you to go against your conscience and give to an institution uh, as a congregation, because we can talk about the fact that we all have institutions uh, later on in what, this. What I mean is if we're worshiping together in a congregation and the elders decide we're going to send a check to this, that right. compromises how we can yeah. be in fellowship with one another. Just whereas, like, whereas if it was just a matter of, okay, there are members here that think that organization is worthy of support, do it individually, no division. Yeah, well, I know of congregations who've tried very, very through very difficult conversations to overcome that division. But you and I both know that we've been marked by people who use one cup. We've been marked by people who are against the Sunday school. Yeah. And they're asking, well, aren't we giving it up? We could have unity. Right. Well, it's because we have looked at these patterns and drawn different conclusions. And I think how Scripture authorizes is a very big part of that discussion. Uh, it's beyond the scope of our discussion tonight. But, you know, to me it seems like what leads us to the conclusions you and I share about women in the pulpit or um, some of the progressivism, instrumental music things, is using the same kind of approach that I'm talking about when I ask, why doesn't this pattern, uh, why aren't we bound by that? Well, I'd, I'd like to counter by saying I feel like I'm being very consistent. Gender roles are tied to creation. It's something Jesus talked about. It's something Paul talked about. When we're talking about general benevolence, we're quoting a lot of Paul and we're quoting a lot of James because we're looking at the particular and not thinking about the universal. And I think the same could be said for music. Uh, you've got a question later on about that, but I, I'd, I'd like to follow up with, with that. Um, so this, this goes right in line with what we were just talking about. Where do you believe non-Sunday school or one-cup brethren err in biblical interpretation? Well, I can't really answer that without addressing those issues a little bit. So if you'll bear sure. with me, I think as we're thinking about those, um, I think when we're talking about what what they will argue on the memorial, I think Scripture teaches there are only two memorial elements. Uh, he can't hear us. Can't hear? Um, I think Scripture teaches there are two, ele two memorial elements, uh, the bread and the fruit of the vine. Um, I don't believe that the cup is representative of a third element, and there are those that will make that argument. Um, I think as well, uh, from Luke chapter 22, verse 17, there, that cup which is blessed and as the uh, memorial of Christ's blood uh, is from the cup that had previously been divided. So I think the container becomes something of no consequence. On the issue of classes, Acts chapter 18, verse 26, provides authority for there to be studies outside of the full assembly of the church, even studies there in which men and women are discussing issues uh, together. Now, when it comes to uh, those, um, I would oppose a Sunday school institution the way many of the denominations do it. 
in which they have a separate organization that has its own independent organization and that kind of thing. I don't think there's authority for that. However, I do believe that there is authority for the elders to feed the flock through studies as they decide, whether they're smaller or of the full congregation, Acts 20, verse 28. I also believe that women are commanded to teach in some context, Titus chapter 2 and verse 3. And our non-class brethren and our one-cup brethren uh, on each of those things, I think, will um, we'll try to bind some things that I th don't think Scripture teaches. Um, so I think, I don't know if that answers your question or not. So you're talking about general and specific authority, right? We've been told to partake of the, the feasts of our Lord, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the, the vine, but we've not been told uh, specifically that we are not to use multiple cups. Yes, yes, and I think in the examples as it is given, I, the text that I mentioned from Acts, uh, from Luke, excuse me, 22, verse 17, uh, there, if it is from a cup that's previously been divided, I don't know how you can then argue that the cup itself becomes a memorial element. I think it's the contents that are the memorial element. Well, let me, if, if I could follow up quickly. Sure. Just, what would be the difference between uh, being on the board of a publishing company and what you described as a denominational Sunday school board? Uh, help me to, uh, I'm not arguing for a denominational structure. But when you say, is it because of the money that institutions receive money from the denomination? Obviously, the structure of the denomination, I'm not yeah. suggesting that we ought to be denominational in mm -hmm. our thinking or activity. Yeah. But do you see why some might, like myself, say, well, you brethren have institutions as well? Well, on the question of, of what's the difference, say, in uh, collectives that are done and what I mentioned when I said the Sunday yeah. school organization. Um, I've got family, my mother's people going back were involved in the non-class movement. And uh, from what I understand, part of what their concern was is this organization that basically becomes separate and distinct, and they oppose that. And I would oppose that too, because if we're gonna say we're following the patterns of scripture, we've got elders and deacons and saints, and we're working with one another. Where do you see in that that you're going to have a superintendent and you're going to have that kind of... That's what I'm talking about with that. Now, I think it's kind of comparing apples and oranges to say, what about outside of the congregation in terms of things we do as individuals? Can there be collective activities that we do with one another? Sure there can. Um, and I think that's a different thing than what I was describing when I was speaking to Sunday school organization. Yeah. I want to come back to that because I, I'm having trouble separating the work of truth or Florida College or Athens Bible School sure. from what we're talking about now, but I don't want to take any more time. You bet. This is one we discovered we'd left off our notes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, In your second article, you wrote, while congregations might choose to do benevolence differently in their autonomous function, yeah. no congregation can neglect the widows, orphans, or suffering in their communities on the basis of these passages. Now, let me say, and this is a little bit of a long question, so bear with me. We're not encouraging neglect of any suffering. The issue is how can that suffering be addressed? If there's no authority for something, then I would argue, addressing your wording, we don't have the right to, quote, choose to do benevolence differently, unquote. Paul taught the same thing in every church, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 17. You then wrote, uh, personally, if members of a particular congregation choose to do this individually rather than from the church treasury, that is their decision to make, but to call uh, sharing and benevolent work uh, of aiding both Christians and non-Christians from the treasury unauthorized cannot be substantiated from the text of Scripture. Now, one of the reasons I wanted us to make sure we got this one is, to me, that seems like a different definition of what makes something authorized. Uh, from what I understand, for something to be authorized, it must be found in Scripture. Yeah. Now, if we don't find it in Scripture, we don't have the liberty to do it differently. So how would you define something as authorized? If you'll define it for me, are you talking about a practice? Or are you talking about a principle? Well, 
you can look at the specific things you were referring to, right. support of an institution or right. something, or uh, support of non-Christians. But basically, I'm talking about anything. Yeah. You know, how do we, if we're going to say something's authorized, we got to have book, chapter, and verse for it. Right. Amen. And I think we start with, let's talk about benevolence, okay. since that's our next section. Yeah. Uh, there, we not only have examples, we can get into these specifically, but we also have declarative statements. I mean, you and I would disagree on the teachings of Galatians 6.10, although we find a lot of common ground. Mm -hmm. I would affirm that we especially take care of the household of faith. I mean, there's no doubt that the particular focus of the church's benevolence are on the saints, but the universal appeal at the beginning of that verse, I can't find anything there that sustains an individual-only argument. And so when I talk about authority, let's just use that statement. We won't get into all the others now. I would then ask, okay, how's that reflected in the historical, theological, and literary context? Let's zoom out from that. And that's going to require that we go to their town and consider this is a methodology that I've used in some undergraduate Bible classes at Fried Hardeman from a book titled Grasping God's Word. It's written by a couple of guys, Duvall and Hayes. And the idea is, contextually, you go to their town, you start trying to understand what was being said in that original context. And then you ask the question, not only what were they hearing, but how can I build a bridge on principle, looking at those commands and examples and inferences that allows me to then apply that in our town, understanding where that fits on the biblical map, understanding how the genre of that particular passage communicates that teaching. So in benevolence, I would ask, okay, what are those de declarative statements? commands or interrogative statements, imperatives. How do we see that lived out in the life of the body, in the life of Christ, and in the character of God, which we'll get into more later on? And then how does that look in application? And so the application, for example, of congregations only being able to give, here's the pattern from Philippians 4 you mentioned earlier, to Paul the preacher, okay, what congregation was Paul working for at that particular time? What if a congregation doesn't have elders? Not only that, but the way that Epaphroditus takes that offering in Philippians 4. There are delegates in other settings in Corinthians. Sometimes Paul says, you choose, in the example we're using from Acts. And so the patterns here may vary depending upon that context. So I'm not using context as an escape hatch from what it is God's Word has to say. But my concern is, like we started, when we began naming off patterns that do not fit that same trajectory, I think that's where we get into trouble, including the four examples that I started with. You know, uh, Paul describes becoming all things to all men, but I don't see that as ever being something in which do it this way, here, that way, there. Frankly, I think if we were to go that route, how can we object to anything that any denomination does? You know, on the other hand, if we say, let's just follow what we can find, and not yes, context becomes important, and we'll talk more about that. It's foundational. Yes, but it also becomes very subjective if it's a matter of, well, this didn't apply in this town. It does apply in that town. Whereas we can be united if we say they did it, we did it, we do it. I'm not asking for us to dismiss the truth of Scripture, but, for example, head coverings in 1 Corinthians 11. What was that about in that world? What's that about in our world? We might, we might disagree on that because we're talking about context. We're also talking about language, context and content. Mm -hmm. And so this is not just subjective, hey, you do it your way, I do it my way. Let's build on the foundation of God's Word. There's authority there, but let's not bind where we shouldn't bind. When Thomas B. Warren used the example of the farmer with a 100-foot rope. Uh, some allowed that cow on the rope to go 150 feet, some only 50 feet. Both of those violations are against the authority of God's Word. And so I'm calling us back to that authority, but in a way that respects what it is that God communicated through these inspired 40 writers over 16 centuries in His inerrant Word. So I think rather than just saying, wow, that's so subjective, you're like the denominations, let's talk about those specific questions, starting with uh, but maybe benevolence. Now I thought through this. in our notes... Biblical interpretation. Yeah, let's go there next. Okay. You have the next question, I think, okay. again. Um, in, your, in your second article, you wrote, when appealing to 1 Timothy 5, one must note that there are responsibilities given to families if certain criteria apply, and other responsibilities given to congregations as a form of spiritual kinship if different conditions exist. Now, you had made an argument in your articles that there's a post-enlightenment 
attitude of individualism that we are bringing to this in discussions such as Galatians 6. If what you just said from what I quoted is true, it seems to me that that, that post-enlightenment distinction fails because, you know, we're not saying that we have the same sense of political identity that came after the Enlightenment, but that's not really our issue. Our issue is, are there distinctions between what the individual or the family does and what the church does? And I would argue, can, can we dismiss this post-Enlightenment argument? I think the problem is dismissing it is a failure to recognize it impacts the way a lot of people read Scripture as 21st century Americans or 20th century Americans, which is really where this conversation starts. Let's talk about some examples. I think to read scripture and lack an awareness of what honor shame culture meant in the teaching of Jesus or in the writings of Paul, or perhaps fictive kinship, like in Mark 3, when Jesus looks around at the crowd and says, you are my mother and my sisters and my brothers. How revolutionary and shocking that would have been in his context. Or reciprocity, the idea that because you've helped me, I'm going to spend the rest of my days looking to help you. I'm just talking about the fact that there's a reality that we do not look at individualism in the same way they did based on tribes and clans and households. I mean, frankly, a part of our conversation about church buildings, we often will say, well, that's post-Constantine, post-Constantinian shift. But they were assembling in meeting places that frequently involved homes. And some of our differences and designations there get rather complicated when we talk about social activity and the life and work of the church and the finances of the church in these varied settings. And so I'm certainly not dismissing the reality that there are things the corporate body can do that I as an individual Christian cannot do. I'm just suggesting you know, that it, this division is a 20th century American discussion as much as it is a discussion about biblical authority. If, if what you just said is true, though, I think this post-enlightenment issue becomes inconsequential because what we're talking about is not, are we exactly the same way they were in the first century? No, there's obviously some differences. But can we look at Scripture and determine, here's what we individually should do, here's what the church collectively has authority to do? And I, I think that's the issue. Yeah, well, and as we think about that, let's think about authorial intent. What was Paul's thinking like on this? Now, God's the one who inspires this text, but you and I, I think, would agree that uh, Paul's worldview matters. The worldview of the readers matter. And so if they didn't read this, like, I mean, the Bible wasn't first written to us. And again, that's not a, a way around the authority of Scripture. I'm just suggesting that in this discussion, not necessarily in what you and I have exchanged, but historically, there have been a lot of boundaries drawn that I think Paul would look at and say, what are you talking about? Well, the only way we can know what Paul would have done is by what's said. That's right. And that's the challenge, to, to hold to what, what it said. Yeah. And well, you his, have a bunch of questions on in Galatians. In his context, yeah. Let's, his you context. Don't gotta, yeah. We can go to Galatians. Uh, so I, I want to talk about Galatians 6.10, and I know we've, we've gone back and forth on this already some. Uh, who were the addressees of Paul's letter to the Galatians? What do we know about them? How does it impact our understanding of Galatians 6.10? And then how would the text of Galatians 6.10 need to look for you to believe that this instruction really was for the corporate body and not just for individuals. Okay. Galatians uh, chapter 1, verse 2 identifies it as the churches of Galatia. It's unique in the fact that this is to a grouping of churches rather than to an individual congregation, as some of the other epistles are. Yeah. Um, now, in terms of placement of that, the northern Galatian theory would put it uh, further west. I favor the southern Galatian theory, and I think you touched on that in the articles. That would involve Lystra, Iconium, Derby, uh, places Paul had preached in Acts chapter 14. Now, in terms of what we know about them, we know they faced opposition from the beginning. We know that they had a background. Uh, some were Jews, some were Gentiles. Um, perhaps what you were aiming at, though, specifically is what's the problem that he's addressing. And from the text, we can know that they had um, issues that I think were, were collective in nature, uh, Galatians chapter 1, verse 6 through 9, there are those teaching a different gospel, and he explains that somewhat as a result of this Judaizing influence that's going on there. And we see as well that they seem to have problems, Galatians 2, um, 11 through 16, with segregation from Gentiles. However, I think there are also many things that are individual in nature. 
Uh, and one that I'd give an example of is over in Galatians 5, verses 3 through 4, the question of should you personally be circumcised or not? That's really not a collective decision. That's a personal, individual decision. Um, now, towards some of your other questions, you asked how does this impact our understanding of Galatians 6, 10? Well, it comes at the conclusion of the letter when Paul is then talking about walking in the Spirit in contrast to walking in the flesh, Galatians 5, uh, verse 16 and following. And I think it comes in the context of, he's talked about a number of behaviors that they need to avoid that would be walking in the flesh, hatred, envy, adultery. Those are, again, individual in nature. Even though he's directing this to congregations, you know, hatred, envy, uh, adultery are individual behaviors. And so I think it comes in that context. Now, your last part of your question, how would it need to look <laughs> for me to see it the way that you are? I, I don't like to presume or speculate on what Scripture could have or should have said. I think the challenge is for us to confront what it actually says. I agree. Um, with that said, though, I, I think we have to realize the issue is not really is Galatians 6.10 individual or collective. And what I mean by that is it could be collective in a distributive sense. In other words, all of you need to do good. And that still would not uh, lead us to say that this is talking about what they needed to use the collection for the saints for. And I think that that's where uh, some of the problem problem comes here. And you're building that off of 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, which you've suggested is the passage for the governance of the church treasury? I use the term precedent. And mm -hmm. when it comes to how does the church get money, mm -hmm. that. But we also, I've noted already a little bit tonight that you've got several passages in which that collection or those types of collections are referred to with the qualifiers for the saints, for the poor, among the brethren. And so I think those help to uh, address that as well. So in 6.1, brethren, in 6.6, 6, he uses the koinoneo verb here to mm -hmm. talk about sharing. And that's where some have suggested that we have authority to pay preachers out of the budget because you actually are there told to share with the one who teaches you, which comes from the treasury. Mm -hmm. uh, then as we keep going, we see the you plural in verse 11, see with what large letters I'm writing to you, the hortatory subjunctive in 6-9, let us. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to me that this allows us to sort of, I mean, I agree that this is written to individuals who have their corporate identity in Christ Jesus. And so to take, again, a pattern that I don't see as a binding prescriptive pattern in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, for how the treasury is used, in any setting, anywhere, mm -hmm. because that was tied to a tragic circumstance in Judea that those brothers were sending relief for that we see described elsewhere in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. So, Would so you, how is it in this context that we get around the fact that Paul's addressing congregations? And, and by the way, 1, 2, yeah, churches of Gal 3, 1, foolish Galatians, that's all we know mm -hmm. other than Acts 13 and 14 on the first missionary journey. It just seems like we're able to have our cake and eat it too, we say that's individual when it's always been true that God's particular focus on Israel, on the church, has a universal goal of bringing people into the fold. And I think that, I can demonstrate that. That doesn't always mean, though, that the collective does everything the individual does. Well, that's Whether right. Whether you're talking about Israel or you're talking about the congregation. That's right. It, I but the individuals if, have their identity in the head, who's namely Christ. And there's a number of metaphors we could look at. Yeah. So I just, I, I think that this becomes a very difficult passage to talk about because it seems that we are able to sort of isolate it from the context of the rest of Galatians 6, especially when in the don't pay the preacher controversy of the early 20th century, we use verse 6 to defend paying him out of the treasury. So how can I use verse 6 to pay the preacher and then in verse 10 say that's individual? Well, if you, if you did have something more like 1 Corinthians 16, that comes at the end of the book of Galatians. I, I think your argument would have more plausibility. Doesn't Paul connect that to Galatians, 1 Corinthians 16, when he says, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so I direct you. 
I mean, there's a clear connection here. And also, who's to say, and I'm not, I'm, I'm just asking this question, if that's the prescriptive usage for the church treasury, are we authorized to use it for anything other than disaster relief? The same could be said of Acts 11. The same could be said of 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And, and so it's as if we get to pick the part of the pattern. We're going to bind this in the treasury, but we're not going to bind this in uh, with regard to being able to support an evangelist, circumnavigating really the elders because we can only give directly to the preacher. Now what what is, I'm arguing is you see in 1 Corinthians 16 how you are authorized to be able to get support. You agree that the church can have... It's a worship, worshipful act. A worshipful Amen. act. And you agree that there can be a treasury. Okay. Yeah. How do you get that? 1 Corinthians 16. How do you use it is what I'm asking. Yes. And, and 1 Corinthians 16 says disaster relief. Well, the point I made earlier, though, is that sets precedence for how the church gets any type of funds. Now, that being the case... Uh, you see other passages that talk about the use of funds. And so I think it one follows one follows the other. Would you argue that it's the normative way we get funds? If Would you allow a widow to leave her estate to the Olson Park congregation? Um, if it was a contribution on the Lord's Day and it was handled that way, you know, I, I mean, if that's what she wrote into her will, that her children would do that, I, you know, that's that's a choice that she could make. So as long as that check's put into the plate on Sunday, it's authorized. Well, you know, there's difficult kind of questions like that. I think the issue is, I know, if I do it on the Lord's Day, I'm following patterns. And I think, you know, all of those kinds of other issues, uh, you know, become a little difficult to sort out. Yeah, uh, That's a very difficult uh, pattern to sustain, I think, with regard to governing the treasury based on two verses that seem to have a specific application. But here's the thing. How can we look at a denominational world and say, no, you get out of your money-making uh, operations and follow the pattern of Scripture if we allow all sorts of other ways? Whereas if we just keep it simple and do it, Lord's yeah. Day collection. But the abuse of something doesn't negate the validity of that something, right? I mean, the abuse of marital, a marital relationship doesn't negate the institution of marriage. So sure. just because the denominational world does it doesn't mean that it's inherently vile. I mean, they could have some practices that actually are affirmed in Scripture. So, again, I just think when at the root of our division, it seems to me that a lot of this, I don't want to overstate it, is about money. And so if we're going to build this whole theology on two verses in 1 Corinthians 16 that then have implications for every practice we're involved with, I think we need to be able to say, well, if a widow leaves her estate and it comes into the treasury on a Tuesday, that's not inherently sinful. If I put money in a bank and it draws interest, yeah. I'm not interested in making money, but aren't we all doing that? Well, our denominational friends would say, you're building a whole case on instrumental music on two verses. And I, I don't you know, believe I, so. Well, got, I agree. Let's talk about that. I agree, but I think... It's different. I, well, I, I don't necessarily think so. Before we leave the Galatians issue, you brought up in, and this leads to my next question, you brought up in the fact in the articles that I mentioned it in the first article and then didn't go back to James 6 verse 10. Um, I actually never addressed James 127. Sure. Now, the reason for that, um, I think throughout the years, both of those passages, Galatians 6.10 and, and James 127, have become kind of gridlock passages. I think what tends to happen is we start talking about it and one will argue individual, one will argue collective, and it doesn't move much beyond that. That's why part of what I chose to do in the articles was address two other matters that I think could be pertinent to the discussion that at least I haven't personally heard as much discussion about. And those two had to do with the descriptions of sure. the collection and had to have to do with the use of the word koinonia. And I've got kind of two questions here that I'm going to offer to you. First of all, how do you explain the consistent use of the term saints or brethren in connection with the collection and its purpose? And how do you explain identifying it as a koinonia uh, in such near proximity to prohibitions of koinonia? Yeah, thank you. Uh, let's start with the koinonia and then come back to the saints. Let me, let me clarify. Prohibitions of koinonia with unbelievers. Right. We're talking about 2 Corinthians 6, 14 and following 
where Paul warns about being unequally yoked, which is a very individualistic context, I would argue. And then we go to chapter 9 in the context of the collection. And I think what we need to avoid here, Kyle, and this is something that I've tried to work on avoiding, but I'm guilty of it on occasions, is the word count fallacy. The idea that just because the word koinonia is used in these two contexts, it means exactly the same thing. Koinonia could be sharing, it could be participation. We know from what Paul writes that this could involve the giving or receiving of this. And so I find it interesting that this same term, as this same passage is being quoted uh, elsewhere, especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 with regard to church discipline, uh, Paul uses the same language to describe disassociating and not being unequally yoked. Uh, it's actually Deuteronomy 22.10 and Leviticus 19.19. 19. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9, he says, uh, be careful in these associations and notice who he's talking about here. He actually says this is not about the world. This is about those immoral believers who are bringing reproach upon the church. Don't associate verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 5 with any so-called brother if he's an immoral person. And then he says, I did not mean, verse 10, with the immoral people of this world or with the covetous or swindlers or with idolaters, for then you'd have to go out of the world. So my question is, if we connect Koinonia and 2 Corinthians 6 and 9, it's not just a question of financial support. It's a question of any connect any connection at all, any association at all, any conversation, any ability to evangelize, any ability to pray for, which goes back to the saints question. I mean, that same language of for the saints, and I've already identified that I think it's primarily about... Go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I just wanted to, before we shift yeah, yeah. to that, um, on this, I would, I would agree that that family of words that's drawn from koinos... Um, it always has a context in which it's being used. It's a bond, and it is uh, cooperation in a bond. And you always have to ask the question, what bond is being right. addressed? We cannot, and I'm, I'm not making the assumption that every time quantity is used, it's talking about what we read in Philippians 1 verse 5, the fellowship in the yeah. gospel. Even in close proximity, it's well, possible for that meaning to change. Well, let's, let's think about that. Uh, as an example of what we're talking about, sure. you know, one of the words that will be used, koinonos, will be used of the partnership between Peter, Andrew, James, and John in the fishing business. Sure. That's not fellowship in the gospel. No, it's sharing. Sharing. Okay. It's human fellowship. However, it does always Brotherly. seem to be a shared activity. When it is talking about that spiritual kinship, it does seem to involve that spiritual uh, cooperation in a common bond. Now, if we're going to argue that in six, it is talking about something that is a spiritual bond, but in second Corinthians nine, it is not. Can we look at second Corinthians chapter eight and verse four? Yeah. Notice the wording that's used there. And it's talking about the same gift from chapter nine. They're imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship, koinonia, of the ministering to the saints. The sharing or participation. Now, it seems to be that what you're arguing is it loses that sense of spiritual kinship in chapter 8 and in chapter 9. And I, I, I can't see that. You know, for him in chapter 6 to say we can't have that spiritual kinship with unbelievers, but then to use the same terminology in chapter 8, of the gift of the collection for the saints. And in chapter 9 of that, to me, didn't follow. Well, what I'm asking you, in 6.14, when Paul says, here's the prohibition, do not be bound together with unbelievers. It's the same word. I mean, that's the, the thrust of your argument. So is the suggestion there that that's not just financial. Because you're 8 and 9, we're talking about the shared collection. Agreed. Right, for the saints. So... It seems to me that we're talking about a different context. That's the question. It's the same word, but it's a different context. And proximity in 8 and 9 is the same topic. We're not talking about the same sort of being bound together in 614 that we're talking about in 8 and 9, or we could have no associations. Where's the delimitation in 614 that this is about finances? So if you're going to argue 614 says don't I'm, share or participate. I'm not saying 614 is either just talking about that. I'm, I'm saying it's talking about a type of spiritual kinship we are not to have with unbelievers. And then in two, in two chapters later, you seem to be arguing 
that he's no longer talking about a spiritual kinship, but there, you know, in, in chapter 8, I don't know how you can include the unbeliever in it, but you're arguing, I think, that in chapter 9, then he includes the unbeliever. And, and I'm just arguing that, yes, we're to be generous with all, but that can involve a type of koinonia kinship yeah. that he's describing in these passages. I think we need to talk about 9.13 in particular, but what I'm suggesting is 6.14 is a call to not associate. There's nothing there financial. 8 and 9 is about a shared collection, how the church edifies and encourages. We can talk about the and all, but uh, I see that as a different context, even though it's the same word. Now, I interrupted you as you were moving to talk about Yeah, the on saints. the saints, I would just point out, because I want to get to benevolence as well, that you've got some other examples, Ephesians 6.18, pray for the saints. Does that limit that we don't pray for anyone but saints? Perhaps Colossians 1.4, we love the saints. We don't pray for anyone but the saints. I mean, this is a collection that's being identified primarily for these Christians who are struggling in these uh, areas that have been impacted by disaster. Uh, a number of brethren have written on the urgency of this disaster. that has got to be a part of it. There's got to maintain equality and a number of other things that are based on the Acts 11, 27 through 30 pattern that you suggested uh, exist earlier on. I would argue there's more of a principle-based application there. So my question is, if we're going to use that language of the collection being for the saints and only for the saints, then it seems to me that prayer and love and evangelism and a number of the other things that, especially in Acts 5, 11, a couple of places in 1 Thessalonians, may our love for one another abound and for all people, there's that universal appeal, and I would just want to be very careful contextually not to delimit this to something that's just about money. It seems to me that it's really difficult to take the scalpel and talk about whether we're talking about benevolence or perhaps outreach, service, to only talk about money when we're also needing to talk about love and prayer and service. Same language is used in those parallel contexts. One of the, one of the differences with those things is you have other examples, you have other instruction that that expand those areas of love. And one of the things I was thinking of with this, and maybe I'm just simple-minded, but your kids that are over here, you give them some money and you say, now this is for groceries. Are you going to be upset with them if they spend it for something else? I think you would. And, you know, the same thing applies here. You know, particularly 1 Corinthians 16, that word that's translated for is the Greek word ace or ice. And, you know, that's we've used that in arguments with our denominational friends in Acts 2.38. Yeah. That it's it's describing, you know, it's that's the word that's translated for remission yeah. of sins. You go from a state of being unforgiven to a state of being forgiven. Right. Is it not directional here? It is to, unto, or into, or unto the saints. You know, the advantage my kids have is they know their father. They have a relationship. There's a context in which those words are spoken. And I think, again, as we talk about silence, we need to come back to that context and ask, is it incidental? Is it prohibitive? We can get into that more. I'm, I want to make sure we have time to talk about <laughs> Jesus in the midst of this you as bet. well. But uh, would it be okay for me to yield uh, question four on context since we've already talked about 2 Corinthians 9 to some extent? I wonder about skipping down to uh, your question number seven for the sake of time regarding the work of the church in the church. Sure. Okay. I was geared up to answer some of those. But oh, I, that's all right. I know how you feel. If we could stay another hour. <laughs> well, one of the folks wanted us out of here after 25 minutes, so I don't think we're going to make that. Oh, really? No. Well, when someone said he couldn't hear, it reminded me of a lady who took her hearing aids out one time. She's being baptized, and I gave what I thought was one of the most eloquent baptismal speeches I've ever given. And she said, looked at me, kind of confused, and said, I can't hear a word you're saying right after the myth. And uh, so it's always an adventure, right? Yeah. All right, so you, you said question, question number seven, seven here? Yes, sir. All right. Paul teaches some things that are not to be done as a church, or literally, from the Greek, in the church. And some examples of that, 1 Corinthians 11, 18, uh, 14, 28, and 14, 34, and 35. Does that not draw distinctions between the work of the individual and the work of the church? And doesn't that show that there are things that the church cannot do that the individual can do? Yeah, you, uh, the passages that you used here are obviously all involving the same prepositional phrase in Ecclesia. Yes. Uh, it's about regulating the assembly. It's in the context of 1 Corinthians 11 through 14 with regard to gender roles, which we agree on with regard to the uh, communion, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 3 through 16 regarding headship. And I think part of what's interesting here is 
we would agree on the meaning of ecclesia. I mean, no one's tried to use the etymological background here to argue for something different. 77 times in the Old Testament, 115 times in the New Testament, usually designates a place or time of assembly. I don't want to dismiss the meaning of that word. My concern is that when we only camp out on that word, uh, let's consider some other metaphors, and the beauty of these metaphors is, including assembly, they're all tied to Christ. He is the, uh, we are his body, Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, we're his household, Galatians 6.10, one of the ones we've been looking at. Uh, we're a part of the bride of Christ. Uh, as the body, we also are the temple, uh, living stones. And in every one of those images, our identity is tied to Jesus directly. And so while I would agree that there are things that I can do as a Christian individually that the church corporately cannot do or vice versa, it's difficult for me as a Christian individually to ever step aside from my identity as a part of the church. I'm not carrying that work individually in a way that represents the corporate assembly. But I think part of our problem, when we look to these examples, even the Old Testament examples, we fail to remember the covenant. We fail to remember our connection with other members of the body. That's the language of Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. So I would agree that there are things that I can't do that the assembly can do or vice versa. But I think the problem is we try to take the individual out of that corporate setting. I mean, can the church be the church outside the assembly? Yeah, and that was, uh, that was one of the issues when you mentioned a while ago, the collective with you and your wife and a decision. Yeah, Matthew you know. 18, 20. Yeah. Two or three are gathered. Yeah. I think, and I went through in one of my articles and dealt with universal church, local church, church actually assembled. And the reason that this becomes even a question is because there are things that apply to one context that do not apply to another uh, concerning organization, concerning activity. Uh, it's not shameful for a woman to speak any time that she is a member of the Lord's church. However, in the assembly of the church, mm. it is described in 1 Corinthians 14 yeah. as shameful. The organization uh, of the local church is distinct from the organization of the church universally. Mm -hmm. And that's where some of these things come into play because there are many things you and I would agree that we can do as individuals, but to then make the false equation, in my estimation, that because we can do it as individuals, we can do it as a church acting. And I, I think that's important for us to understand that not everything we can do as an individual uh, is authorized for the church to do. You know, there are things that the church does in terms of teaching the individual behavior, but that doesn't mean that the church is involved in this. For example, church can teach me how to be a good husband. The church cannot then act as a husband to my wife. And that's obvious. Now, if that's obvious, some of the things that we're arguing, I think we need to apply to that. But the organization of the church applies whether we're assembled or not. And when you use the example of being a husband, I, th I think part of the reason why benevolence is such a touchy question in this division is because we're not talking about women who have good husbands like your wife has. We're talking about orphans. We're talking about those who the church has to care for. We're talking primarily about the household of faith, the especially language of Galatians 6.10. So I I'm not prepared to say that I, as an individual Christian, can step outside of my identity in Christ. I mean, isn't that also a relevant prepositional phrase in Ephesians in particular? It's not just in the assembly. What does it mean to be in Christ? Doesn't that transform my ethic? I mean, who practiced benevolence greater than the Lord Jesus? J not just limited benevolence. I know people say, well, I believe in limited benevolence because we don't help everybody. Well, of course we make decisions, but I'm, I'm asking who, did Jesus practice limited benevolence? Well, Jesus acted as an individual. I mean, with the exception, perhaps, of those things that were done in the feeding of the multitude, you see Jesus being benevolent and generous as an individual. We can do that. You know, you'd said at one point it, it's uh, hard not to get upset when you uh, are told you can't do what the head. I, I'm not saying you can't do yeah. what the head did. I'm saying that the so collective. Our corporate is identity. Different. Sorry to interrupt you. That's right. But our corporate identity. And Jesus says in Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God is among you. I mean, our corporate identity is tied to Christ. So surely you're not suggesting that he's just an individual. He's the individual who models for us. I mean, in the way he helps the Syrophoenician woman, 
in the context of saying, I came for the lost sheep of the household of Israel, there's a particular application, but a universal appeal. And that's, I think, part of the problem. Even with the law of Moses, Isaiah 40 and 42, there's a light to the nations to be considered here. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. And I think when you limit benevolence, you might as well limit evangelism. Uh, I, there's, and I don't, I don't mean to take our time too much here, but there's a close parallel, in my opinion, theologically between limited benevolence and limited atonement. Because what we end up doing is we ignore what Jesus says and does with regard to the body because we have a system, and that system has to be built on individual and collective action, has to be based on the church can only act this way when they're assembled, and a number of other passages that we have to read through that rubric, and when we don't step into those circles that have been drawn because we've bound patterns that I would say aren't, aren't binding, then we get into a place where I'm asking if benevolence is tied to evangelism, and I believe it is, how can I continue to claim that I am walking as Jesus walked if I'm not loving and serving people like Jesus loved and served people? And that's not just individual. We corporately are identified in Christ Jesus. I just, I have a, I have a difficult time suggesting that the body of Christ can't serve like Christ served corporately. Yeah. Uh, you, you said uh, that benevolence is tied to evangelism. That's interesting. John chapter 6, to me, poses some problems to that, you know, because there you have the feeding of the multitude. And if there's ever a time when you could have drawn in as many people as possible, that was it. They're ready to come and make him king. And yet, what does he begin to do? Teach some of the most difficult things that actually end up pushing people away. Yeah. Now, I think that may challenge us in some of this view. Am I saying we shouldn't be generous and benevolent? There's a sphere in which the church is authorized to do that and the sphere in which individuals can do that. I think what's happened is I think some of the decisions that brethren have made have expanded the work of the church beyond what you see in Scripture. And you can't do that just like First Timothy chapter 5. If they were to uh, take certain widows into the number, then they're burdened and they're not able to do other things. I see your argument as saying, Let's burden the church with everything. Now, I know you're not saying it in those words, but essentially, if, if we take the position of saying the church should feed and clothe the whole world, we can't do that. Well, I'm not saying that, but I think we could agree to help the needy and let God take care of the greedy. I don't think this is a utilitarian argument. I mean, if I have a passion to live like Christ and love others, I mean, the argument that I can't help everybody, so I shouldn't help anybody, I think it's problematic too. And with regard to John 6, that argument would be a lot easier if he hadn't have fed the crowd, if he hadn't have healed Legion, if he hadn't have healed the centurion servant, if he hadn't have said, uh, I'm, you know, I'm the head. I mean, Paul describes him as the head of the church through which we gain our ethic. I mean, he looks at people who are made in the image of God and he desires, I'm not a Calvinist. I mean, John 6, it's not about the drawing. Yeah. I mean, people have free will to make that choice. But what does Jesus do? He loves them and he serves them. And I think we're long overdue your question, and I apologize for that. That's all right. You raised yeah. the issue of utilitarianism. And yeah. I, I, I don't know. We'll get I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me answer that. Um, Please. You had asked at one point in the written questions, is that a utilitarian argument? And I would say no. However, I think a general principle of divine law is God never commands that which is impossible to do. Can the church take care of its own? and relieve saints and other congregations in times of need? Yes. We cannot, nor have we ever been commanded to, feed and clothe the world. So why burden ourselves with that which has not been commanded when we have spiritual responsibilities we need to do? The teaching of the gospel to the whole world is the work we need to be involved in. Well, when they see how much we love them, they might be more prone to listen. I think that Part of our problem here is the Galatians 6.10 principle. Do good to all people everywhere. I don't see that as just an individual call based on the ethic of Jesus, based on the trajectory of God's care and love. First Timothy 2.4, he desires that all people everywhere be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. I don't know why we have to keep evangelism and benevolence in these watertight compartments when really it's a part of being light and salt. Well, a little bit of the issue is, you, you know, the historical uh, problem of the social gospel movement. You know, that's, that's something beyond simply our interaction when you have mainstream denominations that abandon a spiritual perspective. I don't want to do that. Yeah. And I think the issue is 
if we lean that direction, it opens up a lot of things. Now, I, I would agree, if, if there's authority for it, do it. I'm arguing there's not authority for it in this way. Should I be generous when I encounter people as an individual? Yes, yes. But if I expand the work of the church beyond what Scripture describes, I'm also shifting its purpose and its work. And I think that's the danger that we're, we're looking at. So I don't want to put words in your mouth, but collectively the body of Christ cannot serve like Christ. I don't think we see Christ, you know, in the examples even of the uh, feeding of the multitude. You're not talking about something that involves a collection from among his disciples for that. So I think to compare what, what you're talking about is making a false comparison. To say, Jesus did this, so we can do it. You know, how far can we, can we take that? You know, because your argument seems to be that God's behavior, Christ's behavior, uh, is generic authority for various practices. There are a lot of ways in which that doesn't work, though. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus followed the old law. That doesn't mean we've got ge generic authority to follow the old law. Um, in the example of the woman caught in adultery, could we simply say, go and sin no more? You know, imagine this is a member of the church. She's committed adultery, but hasn't demonstrated any uh, indication of repentance. Jesus can do things, sure, but that's that doesn't mean that in every area we can. I'm but, not, I'm not arguing for every, every I'm ethic. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the ethic of Jesus being lived out in the body of Christ. Yeah. And when you have two verses from 1 Corinthians 16 that you're arguing govern the treasury, and that governance of the treasury does not line up with the behavior of Christ or what's stated very clearly in these passages, including Galatians 6.10, I just find it to be, and I hope we have time to talk about institutions as well, troubling, and I, yeah. I want to hush and let you ask a question. The, the issue of ethic is kind of interesting, and I've, I've lost track of where we are. I don't know where we are. Um, <laughs> the, the issue of ethic, um, I'm trying to think how you consistently apply that. Okay. Because there are examples in the Old Testament where there were things they were to do among Israel they were not to do outside of the covenant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you, if you make a comparison to deity, simply because the church is described as the body doesn't mean we become deity. No, but we're it, the holy as he is holy. Correct. How many times do we get that ethical imperative? That's right. That's, that's right. However, asking. look to Jesus. Right? Yeah. You know, the Israelites were not to make covenants with those in Canaan. Mm -hmm. And yet, was God benevolent to them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So does that mean that that was generic authority for Israelite behavior? No. Um, there was one that, that I was going to work in, and I <laughs> lost track of where we are. But, you know, the, uh, the issue of eating of the holy offering in the Old Testament was kind of interesting to me. Yeah. Because the general principle was that no one outside of the priest could eat it. And yet there were some terms under which they could. You know, you'd ask the question about dependence. Right. And uh, uh, I, th I hadn't really thought about, I, I didn't get the point you were making in the articles until right at the end. Uh, but that's an interesting issue because... It really is. Under, under Mosaic law, the general principle was no one except the priest. Even if there was like a visitor, they couldn't. But his family could, and even a servant that he had bought could. Mm. Now, that shows some things that there's a context in which it's allowed, a context yeah. in which it's forbidden. Now, if that's true under Mosaic law, why isn't it true under Christ? And there are other things we can look at. Yeah, well, and part of what I wanted to explore on the dependence is the idea, again, of those household codes that include slaves, young children. I'm certainly not making an argument for infant baptism, mm -hmm. as some might allude to, mm -hmm. in that circumstance, but I'm asking could benevolence apply to people who aren't necessarily in Christ? I mean, the famous A.C. Greider statement about children. You know, if you support a child in need out of the treasury, you're going to hell. I don't believe you would affirm that. And so how do we show concern and compassion, especially for those who are most vulnerable, collectively, as the body of Christ? I mean, based on what he did in Mark 9 and 10, I would think that that represents, uh, in a good way, the, the ethic that God intends for us to have. The, the only way I can know that I'm doing that which is acceptable before God is if I can follow what I see in Scripture. And we might apply these questions of, well, was that 
the way they'd look at it in the first century. Some of that we know, some of it we can't know. But if I do what they they did, uh, I if it's an approved example, I know I can be acceptable before God. I'm just suggesting Jesus is an approved example. Where, do you know where we even are? <laughs> uh, I don't think we've talked at all about institutions. Um, how about we go to... I'd like for you to ask the next question because I feel like I've talked too much. Um, we've dealt with the individual collective stuff here. What about we we skip down to um, benevolence, that last section? Okay. And uh, why don't you ask that first question you have there? I think it's question two or three. Okay. You're, you're welcome to ask that no, first hey, question I've, of benevolence. Yeah, we both talked the same on that. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, is there ever a circumstance where an individual who's not been baptized could benefit from church treasury funds? For example, um, what should be done in assisting children from Christian homes or non-Christian homes from the treasury? And I, I didn't ask this in writing, but a mixed marriage. Yeah. You know, 1 Peter 3, 1 through 6, a Christian woman married to a non-Christian man. Mm -hmm. what, what's the practice you would suggest there? Yeah. Well, that, that first part of your question, the one who's not a Christian benefiting from the funds, you know, properly, uh, if church funds are used for teaching material, if they are used for preaching, that is a benefit that is given to one who is not a Christian. Now, I don't think that's what you're aiming at. I think what you were aiming at perhaps is more the issue of um, those that aren't. And, you know, you had you'd made this statement in your article, and this is what I was talking about with uh, dependence. Uh, in your last article, you said the traje trajectory of Scripture with the examples of household dependence of, of Christians in Acts, Galatians 6.10, James 1.27, and 2 Corinthians 9.13-14 as places where these distinctions cannot be maintained. And as I said, that's kind of an interesting issue. I think if we're not careful, it does almost make that argument that denominational folks have made about, well, Cornelius, the Philippian jailer, were assuming that they had dependents. Now, let's say that they did have those that were, were non-Christians. And this kind of goes to that issue that I mentioned. Leviticus 22, verse 10, is that example where the general principle is, no outsider shall eat the holy offering. Even a hired servant or guest could not. But Leviticus 22, 11, uh, a purchased servant or one born in the house could eat. Now, I think the general principle is that that is a collection for the saints. If there are those within the family of those saints that benefit from it, it doesn't violate that general principle in the same way that the eating of the Holy Offering did. So the household forms a collective of sorts where as long as it's not the head of the household. Well, it reminds me a little bit of 1 Corinthians 7 where it talks about the marriage to an unbeliever. Right. So your children aren't unclean, you right. know, they're sanctified. It doesn't mean they're saved, right. but I don't think in this context of what you're asking, it's not considered the same as just giving it to one that's not a saint. Well, and I don't mean to press the second half of this. I think one of the things that's been very unfortunate historically is this idea of someone hating orphans or children. Yeah. It's not what I'm suggesting. I'm just asking, children aren't culpable. They're not yet accountable for their actions. The saints only benevolence mean that we can't help children out of the treasury. Well, what I what I argued is that there are many ways in which those can be helped individually, um, and you know if you're talking about those that um, that Christians that adopt and they have some need uh, from the the treasury, that's a different kind of issue, I think. Uh, but you know what this is really boiled down to is the argument that says, okay we then have authority to fund another organization. And the, the issue that I have is where do you ever see in Scripture any example? If, if it's a work of the church, the church does it. If it's not a work of the church, then we can't be involved in it. But if it is a work of the church, where do we ever see example of that work being accomplished by paying another organization to do that work? And I think that's that's the... Yeah. The issue. And, and you know, interestingly enough, I think when these divisions first came up, it was largely the church in the budget and orphans' homes. 
Now, congregations get bombarded by every institution in the world trying to solicit their funds. And the elders have the choice whether or not to participate in that or not as an autonomous congregation. And that's what I'm suggesting. I'm having difficulty seeing the difference. I mean, you, you compare Florida College and Freed Hardeman, and I don't want to insult any of the representatives of either institution. But, I mean, since Florida College started in 1944, they started their BA in Bible in 96. Our lectureships are at the same time. We have the same benefit dinner speakers. We have Tim Tebow next year. We had him a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, they're training preachers. I mean, almost every non-institutional preacher I meet went to Florida College. And so to suggest that there's no real relationship between the institution and the church yeah. or a home. I mean, I'm not getting into the incorporated children's home discussion now, but it just seems that that's a very difficult thing to maintain when to get around the collection, we have 12, 13 or sacred selections. I mean, a group of individuals, but who are collectively raising funds to support a God-honoring work like adoption, or who are collectively raising funds to support a God-honoring work like education. But where do you draw the line? And my argument is there's no authority for the church to support any institution. You well, know, I mean, we, we get requests from the Gideons. Can we come and give a, a right. speech now? Do I appreciate right. the work Gideons do? Sure. However... I don't think there's authority for any institution to be supported by the church. Let's move into this. But you're talking treasury. You're, you, when you say church, you're talking collected treasury, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think that becomes that issue of when are you acting as a church versus when you're, yeah, I'm a member of the Lord's church, but that doesn't mean that my actions are representative of the local congregation. Let's move into institutions, if you want. Okay. Um, in your last article, you wrote, it would be a mistake to separate the influence of many non-institutional and institutional brethren from the church-affiliated institutions at which they trained. Now, I would ask you to think about your wording here, because you speak of them as church-affiliated institutions. If we can't find the Bible teaching the church to establish or support institutions, can we really say that we are following Scripture? Yeah, I think words matter. Um, it's like the word vicarious. You know, we, we've, we've talked about some from the articles, meaning that institutional congregations, as they've been described, are just outsourcing their work. We're just paying someone else to be the church for us, which, by the way, is impossible. Uh, but I think the problem here, as I was just alluding to, Kyle, is the fact that Let's see some general inconsistency. Again, when we talk about collected funds that are being set aside based on an occasion in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, where it's just really difficult to find prescription for how those funds are governed when that's in a disaster relief context, and then apply that to the fact that, and I pointed this out in the articles, I'm not suggesting that any congregation would want a sales pitch from Florida College or Freed Hardeman in lieu of worship. That, that wasn't what I was alluding to. But the fact that we have a network, and it may be that we know a brother or a sister who attended Florida College, and because of that we have a relationship with Freed Hardeman, and, that, and while that speaker certainly doesn't come into the assembly to make a sales pitch for the school, we go out to eat afterwards at a home or a restaurant, and then we can all individually give our funds, but because it didn't get put into the collection plate and gathered as one check, I just envision Paul again bringing that collection, how were the recipients of that gift to know which congregation gave from their treasury? We're not talking about checks or bank statements. I just find that to be a little bit difficult to uh, see the consistency there, unless we're saying the church is only the church when she's assembled on the first day of the week, and the treasury are only those funds that have been given, that have been put into savings, laid at the apostles' feet, whether by an individual or a family, it just seems like there are a lot of non-institutional congregations that may not be supporting institutions out of their treasuries, but they are certainly supporting institutions. Well, what am I, I missing? I, I think a lot of it is this confusion of, is everything we do as individuals acting as the church? And I, I really think that we need to boil that down. Yeah. And I really think if we're going to be united, that becomes part of the issue because we can talk about Context, we can talk about how did they view it in the first century, but what did they do? And if we can't find them as a church supporting some institution, 
the minute we start saying, okay, we're going to from the collection for the saints that we both agree can be offered on the Lord's Day, we're going to support this institution. It becomes a dividing line. Whereas if it's something in which you believe there's an institution that's good to support, you make that decision. Um, I think your next question dealt yeah, with. You can, you can make the same decision, right? Um, sure. Let's, uh, yeah, I, I think I just ask a couple of these. So you're not suggesting that you oppose the existence of human institutions that are in some way affiliated with the church. I know you don't like the language, but I, I'm suggesting that yeah. were it not for the non-institutional churches of Christ, Athens Bible School, Florida College, 1213, Adoption, Sacred Selection. I mean, these are Truth Magazine. We're talking about works that a lot of Christians are supporting. And again, are we talking about when as an individual am I not, am I not representing the church of our Lord? Like, when does that ethic change? Yeah. When does that orientation towards the will of God not matter? I, I'm, I'm just having difficulty unless, again, it's all about the money on the first day of the week, which I, I'm not seeing a distinct pattern for how that money is managed other than the shepherds of the flock overseeing those funds, it, it just seems inconsistent. You know, I know sometimes it's easy for us to think, well, it's all about money. What difference does money make? It, it, you know, I came out of an institutional background. And one of the things that was shocking to me was how much is said about how the first century church utilized their money, utilized their funds. And I think um, for us to be consistent, we stand up to a religious world and we try to tell them to follow patterns of worship. We try to tell, tell, tell them to follow patterns of organization. But it's almost as if we get to the money issue and we say, no, no, that we don't have to apply that. And I think we, we have to be, be on guard against that. You had asked the question in, in writing, what is the connection between institutional, non-institutional institutions such as Florida College and Athens Bible School and the church? And I'll tell you the way I'd answer that is in one sense, there is no connection. You're not talking about something in which churches are supporting those institutions. They can rise or fall and the church uh, continues to stand. In another sense, yes, there are individuals that are associated with those schools. But, you know, you and I would agree, uh, and you mentioned in your articles, the direction that some institutions have sure. gone that you object to. Well, is it not just kind of a logical safeguard that, you know, if, if the congregation is not directly connected and supporting those things, they can rise or fall. Uh, you know, independent congregations can rise and fall as well. Sure. But if you keep things in the sphere in which they are to be operated, you know, the fact that you've got in individuals that are associated with Florida College, associated with Freed Hardeman, um, that doesn't mean those are Church of Christ institutions. I hate that adjective. Well, we got to be careful or Amen. that's the direction we're going. I, I'm not going that direction. Well, I think we could make that distinction much more clear if it's just a matter of our congregations do scripturally authorized works as individuals. You can... Uh, do benevolence, you can do uh, support of an institution as you choose. I'm afraid that uh, it's 8.53, and we were going to leave some time uh, for some closing remarks before Brother Greg comes and leads us in a prayer. Uh, would you like to go first in that? I don't mind going first, whatever you prefer on that. We had 51 questions, and we didn't get through them, did we? Can we, can we continue? Uh, I'm not saying now, Yeah. Uh, but I... <laughs> Uh, but I'll, I'll just start if that's okay, and you yeah. can you can You're conclude. Right. Um, I respect you. I, I believe you're my brother in Christ, and you've called me brother. And I'm not saying that that causes us to do away with areas in which we disagree. But I want my children to know non-institutional brethren. I grew up in Columbia, was raised by a preacher I love very much, Ted Burleson at West Seventh. Had great relationships with the brethren at Jackson Heights and College View. Never heard anybody called an anti. Never heard anybody called an orphan hater. And, and this is, I understand the unity and diversity thing, but I'm just, I'm just pleading 
for us to find a way to, rather than huddling in our own lectureships and homeschool groups and universities, and I'm trying to be careful with the language, but without those affiliations, those places don't exist. I, I regret the way that this discussion has been held in many places where debates began and ended with, this isn't personal, and everything that was said was personal. I, mean, I, I, I believe we both love the Word of God. We, we both love His church. That's the institution that we put our faith in. Uh, I just regret that we're living in parallel universes. We're still going to arm wrestle afterwards, right? Yeah. Isn't that <laughs> I, I don't... People say, well, you don't understand. You're young. What I don't understand is how we've allowed this unfortunate division that had there been fewer divisive personalities and decrees issued, we perhaps could have resolved this in a way that was more kind and gentle while also respecting the Word of God. Uh, I just don't see this as something that ought to keep us separate in these ways. And I'm just pleading that we try to continue this discussion in a way that's respectful and meaningful. Um, I, again, I, I love you and I appreciate your work. I love the church. I appreciate these brethren, and I think we can do better. Well, I, I love you too, and I, uh, I, I wish that, and I hope for a future in which these divisions do not exist. And I, as I've tried to uh, stumble through and explain tonight, um, I really feel like if people really understood what's at the heart of this, they would not have to exist because. If we simply restrict ourselves to what we can find in Scripture. Now, I, I recognize that you argue that certain things are binding and certain things aren't. However, you do too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. However, if, if in those areas where, you know, on a congregational level, uh, I think if people had had more love for the Lord and His Word and more love for one another, they could have figured out ways to make this, this work. It does seem to be, just like with the progressivism issue, when you've got elderships that will say, here's what we're going to do. It puts people in a position in which they've, they've got to leave. And, you know, you've un hopefully you understand from what I've said tonight, I don't, the issue with me is not the existence of institutions. The issue is, is there authority for the church to support those? And I say, I say no. If you think there is, the way that we could be united is if it is not out of the collection. Now, you may believe that, and I'll try to persuade you that's not the case, but it compromises our ability to work and worship with one another when that's imposed. Um, and that's the thing that, that, you know, I wish somehow could be worked around. You know, it's not orphan haters. It's not that sort of thing. It's an issue of how do we follow what, what Scripture says. And I'll tell you one of the things I appreciate and respect about you so much. I think um, in the past, some did have an attitude that basically dismissed following patterns of Scripture at all. And I don't see that in you. Now, we differ on where, how, uh, what we understand is binding, and I, I think I'll persuade you one of these days. But um, that's still my hope anyway. But, I feel the same way, brother. Yeah. About you. <laughs> but I, I appreciate that at least you are trying to follow what you find in the book, and it's not a matter of dismissing Scripture because of what you want to do by preference. And I, I love you and appreciate you for that. And I thank you for uh, your demeanor and the way that you've, you've done this, and I uh, appreciate everybody that's come and yeah. listened to us stumble through our notes. So. Well, maybe... This gives an opportunity for more people in their local communities, rather than talking about each other, to talk to each other yeah. and open up the word. And thank you for this time. I know again, thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, if you like our content, if you we'll want to see more videos you. like this, make sure you leave a thumbs up on Appreciate our video and you comment uh, what you thought in the comment section. But also make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you can see uh, our content and whenever we post content. And make sure you follow us on our social medias in the description below. Uh, thank you again. See you next time.